This week, a special Pause for the Cause episode with Jesus Jesse Hernandez and Jen Lacey from No BS with Jen and Jess on how being human is great for business. All right, we're back. It's a new episode style because, well, we can freestyle here a little bit. That's right. No co-hosts. I'm going to get on the microphone. And I brought two of my crazy fun friends with me. Jesse Hernandez, Jen Lacey. I want to start with you, Jen, because you just look like you're bubbling to talk. How are you doing this morning? Where are you coming at us from? What's going on? I'm doing great. And I am in Dallas today. Um, and, um, week's been good. So I'm like super excited to have this conversation because I have no idea what we're going to talk about. We are going to go deep on being human on you guys on what's going on because we met a while back and I have just been dying to do this episode since Jesse, what's happening, man. Where are you coming to us from? You got a whiteboard in the background looking all professional. <laughs> what you doing, man? Man, I'm chilling here in the Deuce Dime, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, this was an awesome break because I've been tinkering around with a new online course, which requires editing. And then there's a new thing I found. There's an update to my editing software. It's like, oh, how do I do that? Anyways, so having fun, enjoying the break to interact with other human beings. Hey. <laughs> Now you know why we got you on. We're going to geek out. Before we geek out, though, you guys know we got a YouTube channel and it's back and it's rolling and you guys are doing great. But we have a little problem. We got to get in the trust tree for a second. I need you to like the show. I need you to share it with your friends. And I need you to give us a review, especially my Spotify users. Spotify, we have two reviews. We've been around for eight years. We can do better. <laughs> So give us those five-star reviews. And hey, Apple, hey, we need those too. So do it. Give me five stars. It'll keep us rolling over here. Plus, you know, I'll carry that one with me as a, as a woohoo. Because yes, I do read them. So hey, get on there. Subscribe. Share it with your friends. Back in 2020, I heard about a new software platform called Join. Within minutes of seeing Join, I knew it had the power to revolutionize collaborative project delivery. In fact, I was so sold on Join that I joined the team as its industry evangelist. Many trade shows and podcasts later, Join is now used by 50% of the ENR top 30. Why? Precon and ops leaders at DPR, Bolt, McCarthy, Barton Mallow, Clark, and others say that they like Join because it does two big things collaborative, trackable decision making, and awesomely simple visuals. Want to learn more about the power of Join? Go to www.join.build forward slash demo to learn about how better gets built. All right, we're back. All right. Now we're going to go freestyle. You've been tinkering around, Jesse. You got a few things going. Jen, you got a few things going. Tell me a little bit, Jen, we're going to start with you. Tell me a little bit about your background, who you are, and uh, kind of what you do. And uh, we're just going to wrap from there. Okay. Well, let me see how to, let me hack it. Let me see how to sum this up the best. So um, in construction now, been here for 20 years. Prior to that was a teacher and a coach which completely prepared me for everything that I've been asked to do and I'm still doing in construction. <laughs> and so I've uh, been with uh, Robbins and Martin National Healthcare uh, Contractor for 20 years. And through that journey have made so many connections in the industry and have learned that um, as much as I love this industry and I wanna try to get people into this industry because it's amazing, it really sucks for a lot of people. And I think what I realized is that I'm one person, but I know a lot of people that I'm connected to and together we can help make this industry better for the people that are in it. I thoroughly agree with you. And so when you say it sucks for certain yes. people, can you give me examples of the suck? Yes. So, um, I mean, some big ones that are a little scary and, and not really easy to talk about are suicide rates our depression, our substance abuse, our heart disease. I mean, those are big ones that don't really have any much to do with me other than just 
historically because of how hard the industry is, because of the expectations on uh, hours put in, and then the wear and tear on the bodies of the people that are in it, and maybe the elevation of people that are not so nice to other people, just a lot of that kind of toxic uh, toxicity that um, has really festered and flourished at the same time. And, um, and so it has caused people to either leave the industry or has had a lot of people make not really good choices because they didn't know there were other ways. That's a great way to break it down. Yeah. And we, it's great that we're talking about it more now, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I think we're on the precipice of just the first, like, part of a problem is identifying that you have a problem Mm -hmm. and then talking about the fact that you have the problem, Mm -hmm. then you can start to take concerted steps to go, to go after it. So it's not surprising that you found Jesse here and, and to go down some of this path. Um, So Jesse, give a little bit of background you and, and then your perspective on some of this and, and, and what, what this means to you right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, man. So I entered the construction industry in the 1900s back before we had, you know, like we didn't, well, we had, if you had a pager, you were like super hot, right? Like you had it going on back then. (laughs) Some people don't even know what the hell a pager is. Anyhow, entered the trade uh, as a plumber. My dad's a plumber and fell in love with construction because of the conditions, right? The excitement, the physicality, the problem solving, the competition, like all of it was like, this is where I belong. And so I decided to make a career of it. Uh, over the years, I went from installer to foreman to had a bunch of different roles. From there, I went to work for a large general contractor, one of the largest in the country, um, as a, I'll call it maybe an internal consultant, change leader, supporter, uh, pain in the butt, I think is how, what they mostly called me. Um, And then I went to work for like owner operator of a national brand as their director of environmental health and safety. (laughs) And now I'm running my own consulting business. And, you know, the, the, I still have a huge heart for the men and women in the trades. Like that is one of the driving forces behind my messaging. And a lot of the things that I'm, uh, well, say a lot of the services that I'm providing is because like Jennifer mentioned, you know, we have. The construction industry is hard on people. <laughs> it is hard on relationships. Um, and we come up with these, we'll say, less than healthy ways to cope with those stresses and all the other things that are happening in our industry. And one is substance abuse. And that was me, like 100% on the outside. It looked like I had it going on. I was getting promotions. I was getting big, giant, fancy, sexy jobs. And behind the scenes, I was I was self-medicating to to deal with the thing. Um, and specifically as a trade, I feel like the folks out there, you know, we, we throw this word around uh, trade partner, which if we're not sharing risk and reward on the contract, I'm not your partner. <laughs> like contractually, <laughs> we're not partners. Call me what you want. Treat me like a human being. And so when we talk about this word trade partner, most people probably think of the entity, the name of the company or their project manager. I'm talking about trades folks, the ones that are putting their hands on the things and building the things. And those I know like we're largely um, invisible until there's a problem. We're largely unheard until we want an explanation. And so imagine living in that situation, always being pressured, pushed. Uh, taken for granted, uh, even, um, we'll say, abused in a way, and expecting to be happy. <laughs> like, how the hell do you deal with that? And so for me, there's a, there's so much opportunity to mend these broken relationships by focusing on the human side of things, right? Like, you're a human, I'm a human. That's what I got to learn in my career path is regardless of education, regardless of socioeconomic background, Regardless if you were running a $3 million project or you're responsible for a couple billion dollars worth of work, everybody involved in that are human beings. And we just don't interact like human beings. For some reason, we show up to work and um, 
I'm a project manager and I'm a general superintendent and I'm a lead manager and you're an installer and like, yeah, yeah. And we're human. So I think that's maybe how, what helped Jennifer and I collide and mesh and <laughs> colliding and having a nuclear meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, 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 maybe you are melting down a few things in your path, but I think it's actually a good nuclear meltdown. It's a little bit of a, we're going to, we're going to run you over. So Jess, talk a little bit about what is no BS with Jen and Jess. Like, what is that? What, what do you guys do and, and where, and, and where does some of this humanity find its, uh, its mouthpiece? Yeah. So it, I think it was an accident, right, Jen? <laughs> We, I had an idea to have some live streams about applying 5S in, in our relationships. Uh, that was the seed for a community. I mean, so that's what it's turned into. So basically, we live stream every other Saturday at 8 a.m. Central. Jennifer and I are up on the screen, and we're talking about a subject that is relative to us as professionals and men and women in our homes, like in our romantic relationships or friendly relationships or whatever. Uh, and we, it's, um, I'll say interactive dialogue with the folks that are watching the live stream because they're really the ones that bring the value and guide the conversation through their comments in the chat. Uh, and people keep showing up <laughs> and they, they invite their friends. And so it, it started off, like I said, a little idea uh, and people signaled back that I think the it was the trust that Jennifer and I demonstrate for each other, uh, the respect that we demonstrate for each other, and the vulnerability that we're able to display because of the trust and the respect resonated with people in the industry because the at work, th those things are freaking absent. Otherwise, why the hell would they wake up at eight o'clock in the morning to <laughs> interact with some weirdos on the damn Internet? If you have it at work, why would you do that on a Saturday? I, I mean, Jen, you're shaking your head. You've got a, You've got a few thoughts on that one. I do. And so what he what he failed to mention, because he sometimes he leaves gaps. And so because he knows that I, that I need to fill them in. And so what when we when he talks about we had a seed. And so he had this idea of us doing some live streams. Um, on 5S and personal relationships. So applying sort of that shine, standardize and sustain, apply it to personal relationships. And so we started, that didn't even exist yet. So we started with, we're going to have five live streams and we're going to talk through these concepts, which were amazing. And then like, we, and then we had people that were jumping in and then it was like, okay, we'll do one more and then we'll do one more. And then like, we kind of, we, the, the feedback was, well, we need more S's. And Jesse and I are like, well, there's no more S's. Like, we don't know what to do. And so at that point, what, what we were getting from the people that had shown up for two and a half, three months were what's next or, or what are y'all going to do next? And Jesse's like, well, we didn't have a plan for anything next. And so he and I kind of got together and started talking about, here's what's happened. Here's what we felt. Here's what's working. And like, there's a need here. And what can we do about that? And that's where I think we were just sitting down one day and we went, okay, well, let's, let's create something that's ours. And then we'll just keep doing this. And we'll talk about things that no one wants to talk about. And that just, and that's where we are two over two years later. <laughs> two, see, and two years flies by, right? <laughs> two yes. So fast. Yes. So it quickly, Jesse showed the book, uh, Lean and Love, and we'll talk about the book for sure. But the five S, Jen, is from Lean. So for my listeners that don't, you know, or, or maybe I call them Lean Curious, like, what is the five S? Like, what okay. does that mean? So I'll give a little bit. I, Jesse gets more technical, but I'll give it. So five S is a tool within, it started in manufacturing, mm -hmm. um, where it's, I mean, you're pretty much making your workspace workable and the best environment it can be. And so to do that, sometimes we walk in and there's a mess. And instead of trying to tackle this mess, it kind of creates a very systematic way to approach it. And it's you, you first you sort, then you set, then you shine, then you standardize, then you sustain. So it's a, there's, there's specific things within, within each category that kind of help you, okay, I've done this. Now I'm going to move on to the next one. And it also creates something that can be sustained. And it's not just I cleaned it up and now it's dirty again. And so it is a it's 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 got structure, and um and it's something that's usually it 
was applied in manufacturing. It has come into construction because, you know, cleanliness and safety and quality are very important. So they have now taken it and applied it to a job site or, you know, to a workspace. And um, and then I'll let Jesse, because I've not taken this, but the, he had someone that maybe he was, you know, having some conversations with that went, well, if you can apply that stuff here and there, could you not also apply it like at home in like in life? And so um, just, you want to tell the story of like how, yeah. how that came about and even the content we talked about? Yes. So I am an advocate that a lot, many, many, many of the lean principles or maybe the lean things that I kind of stick to are universally applicable. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter what industry, doesn't even have to be work. But if it's not universally applicable, why the hell would I do it? It's kind of my thinking. Now, the woman I was dating at the time, I told her that it was the universe. She's an attorney. Uh, and she's like, you think this stuff will work in my office? I was like, absolutely. Um, so anyways, fast forward, relations start, started getting rocky. Um, I wasn't listening very well. And so she wrote these letters contextualizing the 5S system to our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I remember, like, I was brought to tears when I read them. One, because it was genius. I was like, wow, like, that's super powerful. But two, because she took the time to speak a language, to learn my language and speak it in such a way that I could digest it and apply it. Uh, and so one example, like sort, the first S, like get rid of the stuff you don't need. How would you apply that to a personal relationship? Well, one of the things she wrote down was like, get rid of distrust and um, resentment. You want to sort that out, get it out of the system. Like, holy hell. Right. And so it was these kinds of, she went on with the different S's and contextualizing them to be able to apply them. So our relationship, I knew what she had written was powerful and would help a lot of people. And I also knew that I was not going to be able to do all of them. I was done. (laughs) So anyways, those letters were the basis of the of the first round of live streams that Jennifer Lacey and I did. And, and I had those letters for three years before we live streamed about them. And I was selective in picking Jen because of all the people that are out there on the LinkedIn and on the, in the omniverse social posting, messaging, podcasting, It was abundantly clear to me that Jan had a real appreciation for people, uh, obviously commanding presence, and an interest. Uh, Now it's for sure 100% willingness, but at the time, an interest for having a different type of conversation. Uh, And and so that's the rest is history. (laughs) And the rest is no BS, right? The rest is no BS, yeah. And, 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 and it is true. I mean, I, I have, so we all met in person for the first time at so built. Yes. And it was abundantly clear when the two of you hit the stage together, which if, if p- people don't know, so built, uh, just go to so built.com and check it out. S O B U I L T.com. The society for, for what is it? society for built solutions. Go check it out because you guys got up and did a little thing called emotional bungee jumping. And I'm, I'm going to come really clean with you guys. I have tried to get every workshop, everything I've done since get somebody to bite on letting me try this emotional bungee jumping thing. And so, because I like floored at the impact of it. So, uh, you know, Jesse, you want to explain what emotional bungee jumping is? And then I want Jen to talk a little bit about it after, because you're right. Jen's got an interesting presence in a room, right? Like she's bubbly. She's, she's, you know, but all of a sudden I feel like I got to know what she's going to say next. So, (laughs) um, Jesse, I want, I want to start with you first. Um, yeah, yeah. Explain uh, what emotional bungee jumping is. So emotional bungee jumpers, it's a group, it's a community of us building, working to build these practices. At its core, it's about building deeper connections with every human being we come into contact with. That's the point. Now, 
the exercise, the jumping element of emotional bungee jumpers is an exercise. And you have three roles. And some several people have, there's several variations of this, but I'm going to describe the three roles and talk about the purpose of each of those roles, because that's I think is a significant difference. So one is you have a coach, you have a problem owner, and you have a an observer. The coach's job is to listen to the problem owner, not solve the problem, listen to the problem owner and connect with the human being, not the problem. <laughs> and there's some rules. The, the coach cannot ask closed-ended questions. The coach cannot ask leading questions. The coach is not allowed to solutionize or solution shank the problem owner, which means no damn advice. All they are asked to do is ask curious questions and stay connected with the human being in front of them. The problem owner, their job is to share a problem. And what is important about that? Vulnerability. It is a small but gigantic demonstration in vulnerability to say in front of other human beings, I have a problem and invite somebody in to tinker around with your thinking about that problem. The observer's job is to pay attention to the coach and write down all the violations the coach makes. Because guess what? First timers, <laughs> right? Like it's hard. You become two by four to the forehead aware of how horrible a listener we are on the regular. And so the observer, oftentimes first timers, they'll focus on the problem owner or the problem. No, focus on the task at hand because somebody's already responsible for this problem owner. Your job is to give frank and direct feedback to the coach's performance which is another power skill that we think we're good at, right? We're, we're from construction. We have thick skin. And then we tiptoe ballet dance around giving somebody some frank feedback about telling them how horrible their questions were. And so that's the exercise. And it's, it's a timed exercise. And the self-awareness and personal growth that I've seen it have on everybody that does it is profound. And because of that, it's like my one of my primary focuses going forward into, we'll just say eternity. How'd I do, Jen? Yeah. Yes, very good. Well, it was it was really good. And it's funny because you can get away with solution shanking. It has not worked for me. But so I coined the term, I stole it from someone else, solutioneering. <laughs> and I can tell you now that I call out solutioneer, solutioneering all the time. And it is that exercise that made me aware of and conscious of myself doing it and other people doing it. And I get such a kick out of it now, though, at times. Yeah. You know, because sure. the amount of people who do it is amazing. And they do it in business. They do it in personal. So... I, I had that aha moment, right? I had that open. And by the way, you are absolutely right. I was, I mean, and, and you would think, you know, Jen, you would think that, that we would talk about business problems. I have a boss who doesn't want to listen to me, or I have a, this person and I can't. And honestly, when I did it, it was around kids and family life and some really, really tough things came out and you guys coached us to go there. Mm -hmm. Um, so talk a little bit about why you would coach somebody, Jen, to go there into those parts and, and then, and then how some of this impacts the groups that you've done it with, cause you've done it a lot. So there's two things that are super big that Jesse didn't, didn't highlight. So I'm going to highlight them. And then I think I can answer your question. So num one of the big things is in our world, because we are fixers and we are high performing people that are out there changing, changing things. We're change agents. We action, 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 action. Like that's what we live in and we're going. 
And because we live in this mode and a lot of a lot of us that are doing really big things do, we want to keep moving. We want progress. And in our minds, progress means like fixing it and moving on, taking care of it and moving on. And when we're doing this exercise, what's been magical is you have to throw that entire mentality out the window. Because when I, if you're the problem owner and I'm the coach, nothing in me wants to let you continue to dwell and have issues with this problem. Everything in me wants to, here's how it can help you. Here's how I can help you. But that's not the exercise. The exercise is if I come in and I give you one solution, I've now taken the problem away from you. I've now allowed you to let me have that problem so that I can help you fix it. Because guess what? If you go do what I say and it doesn't work, then who's pro- who, then who messed up? I you messed didn't. up because I told you what you should do and it didn't work. And so we live in this world to where, yes, there's a lot of things that work, but there's also a lot of things that don't. And for whatever reason, we feel we've got to take these problems away from people to help them fix them. And they're not our problems. And so this exercise helps people frame up and get comfortable being in a place with people that they're connected with and they care about. And somebody that's even visibly hurting or stressing that it's okay to allow them to keep their problem and that we can help guide them and direct them, not with advice and not with try this, try that, but by just asking the right questions. It's, it's like, that's the magic. That's one of the big magical pieces of it is we, we learn how to ask better questions, curious questions, interested questions, because those questions are focused on the person that has the problem, not what we need to know. And it, it, it's like blowing, it, it, it's, it's crazy. And so there's that piece, which is awesome. The other part of it is because it's so important for the coach to allow the problem owner to keep the problem and to ask the right questions, what we have seen over and over and over again is that the coach gets so caught up in their head about asking the right questions, they disconnect from the problem owner. And we are emphasizing you have to be able to do both. And so how do you ask the right questions and not try to solutionize and stay connected to the person in front of you and not have the next three questions ready to go. That's hard because if you're trying to solutionize it, it's easy. You got one question, two questions. You already know where you want to take them. And so you got them all lined up. But if you're trying to stay connected and you're also trying not to have violations and you're also trying to ask questions based on their last response, if you are not 100% focused on that problem owner, you're, you're not going to do so well the first couple times. <laughs> and so those two, those are two big things that over and over we've seen, but also we've seen those, um, those gaps get diminished. Yes. We've seen people grow those, those elements to the point of they come in and like, yes, they can observe and yes, they can navigate things, but then their questions are like next level. And they they've got people going, I don't know if I ever thought about that or I don't even know. I don't know how to answer that or, oh, crap, I, I know what I need to do. Like when people are, when people respond like that, then you're ma- you're all of a sudden letting them work through that problem. And it's being able to see the growth of both of those. And then again, I didn't even, I didn't even mention the observer role. So <laughs> to me, when we started doing this, which is almost two years ago, you're, I think two years ago, what, what we've, what we learned is and for me specifically in the observer role, I'm I'm really focused on the coach and the person talking, not the problem and not the problem owner. Once we started going through this exercise, every room I walked into, I was like, oh my lord, like oh my gosh, like they they're not even aware that they're taking those problems away, that they're that they're taking those and carrying them and walking out of the room with problems that aren't even theirs because of the way they engaged with the person in front of them. And like the more you become aware of that, then how your conversations change with those people. 
and how you can, you don't have to tell them that's wrong, but you can be like, Hey, let's, let's ask this, you know, whatever. It changed the way that I even interacted in rooms of people that, you know, at all different levels. So those are, I don't even think I answered your question, but those are three things I know needs need to be emphasized. No, you, you, you hit on it because okay. for me, it's, it's the change that you've seen these folks go through and why it's so important. It, I mean, I, I remember this because when you guys did it, Armando Tonalis got up and was the, uh, the coach. And the level of questions that he asked in that role playing to kind of so so you guys know when when we did it, Jen and Jess opened it up, told us all the rules, talked to us about it, and then said, "Okay, we're gonna do it." And then the three of them did it with Armando, who had done it before, standing up and asking questions. And I was like, "Those are so solid. Where did he? Where? How did this?" But he even made a mistake or two, right? And and I forget which one of you was observing and doing, and it was like, "Wow, that's amazing! The difference." And then I went, "I'm like, oh, I I could do this, right? I'm a professional interviewer." Yeah. Yeah, I'm professionally three questions ahead of you trying to tell a story and realizing now that like how often I solution here and how much that's okay in this medium of what I'm doing, right? Because I'm trying to tell a story while we're here. I'm not trying to um, have that, you know, problem question thing, but how, how much that leads me into like when I'm having a conversation with somebody, I'm not empathetic. I'm not connecting. I'm, I'm solutioneering. I'm leading questions. It's, it blew my mind, but what really, what you hit Jen that got me was go all the way back to the beginning. We have a mental health issue. We have substantive abuse issues we have depression we have and holy crap it's because we're taking everybody else's problem putting it in our backpack and walking out the door to deal with it and then quite frankly we're turning around and bitching that <laughs> these people can't solve problems for themselves well that's because you just keep taking them from them jeff yes <laughs> oh dude <laughs> Like, that's the thing, right? So two points. One you made, and I, I want to emphasize, a lot of people get sideways. You know, we have the community where we meet every week or once a month and we do the thing. And then, you know, I've done it for some clients in person with like construction project teams, <laughs> the GC team themselves over a series and with, uh, with amazing results. Anyways, the point is some people think okay, now I can't lead, do any leading questions. Now I can't like, no, 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 that's not the idea. The idea is this, those types of behaviors, thinking three or four questions down the road, leading questions, offering advice are appropriate in some cases. And we are experts at that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. the, the idea is add this to your toolbox, right? Add this to your toolbox so that you can pull it out at the appropriate time. Now, back to the to the mental health thing. And and people, you know, you hear it all the time. People just don't show initiative. They don't make them like they used to. Nobody has any give a damn anymore and all this crap. But the fact is, because of my solutioneering, I what I've done is I've conditioned my people that they have no agency and they don't have the capabilities or the critical thinking skills to think through a problem because every time they come to me with the problem, I hit them with the freaking answer. So eventually they turn their brain off, bring their problems to me. I solve all their problems. And guess what? I got my own damn problems to be solving. And so it's like we're creating our own quicksand, jumping up and down at it and then pissing and moaning because we're in quicksand. And so the, like to your point, this whole thing is like ultimate vision is how can how many people can we cause this shift, small shift in their thinking such that they show up in just a little bit differently. And that difference is profoundly different than the way everybody else shows up. 
And then that's going to motivate everybody to say, what is it that Jeff does? Like, what is that thing that he's doing? Like he, I just feel different when I talk to him. Oh, he listens to me. What is it that Jen does? Right. We talked about Jen's presence. One, she's got a, an amazing presence. She's bubbly. She's warm and she'll beat the hell out of you. But also she listens pretty good, right? Like she, she gives you the space to complete your thought. will ask you questions and demonstrates appreciation in the human being. It's a pretty low bar, but right, it's a low bar out there. But just that separates her and us from the large majority of the interactions that we have out there in the workspace. You nailed it. Cause that brought it right back to the title of the show and why we did this. This is how being human is good for business mm -hmm. because you said it, if I don't answer their questions, but if I in the right space, right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let somebody just learn by trial and error of, <laughs> uh, you know, tying themselves off. Right. You know, like, Hey, this is, this is why we have safety rules. And this is why we have training around that one. This is a, how do I deal with this trade partner? Uh, how do I deal with this problem? And all of a sudden you've, you've, like you said, you, you've activated their agency to solve problems, yes. to be a part of this. Is a, this is how it's good for business. This is how we spread that out wider. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I talk to leaders about this all the time it's so important as you're building a leadership team that you're building a leadership team where people lock arms and carry weight together yeah. and don't just keep lumping the weight on one person mm -hmm. because ultimately any of us will crumble under that. 100%. So, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested, Jen, cause you get to do this coaching on a couple of different levels. You get to do it there. You get to see it done at work. How, I mean, this wasn't easy, right? Was this something that came natural to you? No, or? absolutely not. And, and I'm going to tell one, a big component of all of it is the vulnerability piece. And so I'm only in that because I sucked at that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm doing way better than I did from the beginning. So as much as I am out there and as much as people engage with me, if, if you had to ask them two or three levels in, layers in who I was, they didn't know. Cause they, cause what they got, they, they, everybody knew me and everybody got that first layer. Maybe some got the second layer. They had no idea all the other things that make up me also all the things I was dealing with. So the vulnerability piece and how that plays and weaves into the entire exercise and the entire community and everything Jesse and I do, it's, it's to me, the one thing that sets us apart from everything else. Talk about that vulnerability. Like what is that? I mean, people, people hear this and, and I think they, they don't get a, they don't have a good understanding of what, what is that vulnerability? What does that mean? And what does that look like? Okay. So I'm going to visually, cause I do most things visually is a lot of times, most of us, um, in mainly work and, and for me also at home is we're really good at water skiing. So we're, we're behind the boat, we're holding it, we're right there on the surface. Every once in a while, we may go down a little bit, but we stay right there. So not too, not too much. People don't, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to get too uncomfortable. But what we need to be doing is going deep. And we need to be going deep and going deep and staying there. And that's scary because one, I don't scuba dive and I don't do a lot of snorkeling, but that, that's a different environment. That's a different way for somebody to show up because you are having to rely on a lot of other things other than just yourself. You have to let go of control to be able to put yourself in a place to where like I have weaknesses, I have traumas, I have things that have scarred me that have hurt me that have caused me to not act right to make bad choices like that was a lot of laundry that people sometimes don't want to share and so what you know what environment can we create to where and we didn't go we're going to create an environment where everyone's going to come in and tell their secrets that's not that's not what we started it with it was we need to create a place where people are safe and they feel safe and feel connected to the people that are around them that was really the goal and what we found is because it's lacking everywhere that when people started coming in and realizing no one's going to attack them, no one's going to judge them, no one's going to come back later and bring it up in a conversation three months from now. And remember when you said that, like when we create the environment where they feel safe and they feel protected in that place and that people are really 
connected to the person across from them. Like they came in ready to let go of things and ready to like, I need help. I have this thing I'm carrying and I don't know what to do. That does not happen in our industry. We don't have those type of conversations because everybody knows the answer, did it before. We've always done it this way. And I mean, like that's, that's the way everyone shows up. You can't come in and be weak and not have an answer. And we're trying uh, yeah. to change that mentality. Yeah, because the two things are unfortunately synonymous with one another in the way that we treat it is that if I don't know, then that's a reflection of my intelligence or my experience or or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. When ultimately it's it's actually the hardest thing to do is say, I don't know. I'm and not that's the expert. <laughs> Yes, that's that's putting yourself out there to be be vulnerable for a minute. But it's also it's funny because then we as the observer are, you know, smacking people around from the cheap seats for not being, you know, well, you did it that way and that was wrong. And you're like, but I but if I tell you I don't know, then you tell me that's wrong, too. Like, well, then what's right? How do I, how do I be right? Yeah. Um, how, you know, how does this transformation even happen? Like it, it's so, and you guys do such a good job of making it simple to see Yeah. from here. It's like, and, it's, it's removing the veil behind, Oh crap. Because, you know, we've talked about what this feels like to be the coach what this feels like to be the problem owner, you know, not solutioneering as the, as the coach, not hiding and being vulnerable and, 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 you know, connecting. And then the observer, you know, f- feedback is tough. <laughs> that part, we haven't even hit that part yet. <laughs> that stuff is so hard. I mean, raise my hand. You guys made me do it. And I did not like you, <laughs> not like you. No. Because I, I don't, I don't like it. It, the, uh, it, you know, I remember having to go through uh, uncomfortable conversation training in one of my corporate jobs. Like, and I was like, this is awful. Um, I hate it. Um, and, and it really, it breeds on the job site, right? We sit yeah. around, the three of us have this conversation. I'm the observer. And then what do I do? I don't say anything to you two. I go back and I write an email referencing the contract and I send it to CC all important people. Right. And I just like, uh, then I just shanked both of you (laughs) and the conversation. And it's like, wait, this is so talk to me a little bit about what the observer role can do for business and do for this entire process of what we're talking about. Yes, yeah, go for it. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. And so I'm going to frame it a little, maybe more uh, a reoccurring situation that I've seen that I'm sure maybe one or two of your listeners have seen. So if I'm the, let's just say I'm the supervisor. So the observer role is designed to, to really focus on two big rocks. There's a bunch of little rocks, but the two big rocks are focus on the freaking task at hand. Your job is to observe the coach to give them your observations on their performance. Not solve the problem, not about their eye contact, about their damn questions. It's very explicit. Simple task, do that task. The other is giving concise and actionable feedback, right? So, What happens is most of the time we get connected to the problem and it would be awesome. Actually, I'll give you a pass if you're connected to the problem owner, like the human being, but no, we're, I'm the, I'm supposed to be observing. Somebody's already got the responsibility and the duty to support the problem owner. But now I'm that person's boss and I'm going to like step on their toes and do their job for them. What does that communicate? You don't trust me, right? You have no self-control. You have no discipline. And then when we get to the feedback state, this is how I do my, uh, when I'm in the observer role, this is what I do. Every time there's a violation, I write it down. In the sequence that the violation comes out, that is the sequence that I write it down in. When they ask an amazing question, I write that question down. I pay attention to the body language and like, 
how the the problem owner like whenever they sit back and like look up it's like oh that was a good that question got them they're examining their thinking i want to make sure to reinforce that behavior by calling attention to it and so when i'm going to give my feedback i just read what i wrote down you had three violations they were closed ended questions this is what they were you had another you were leading the witness you you shanked the hell out of her this was a great question there's my feedback It's not, you know, I love the way that you fold your left leg over your right leg and just how warm you made the, like, it's not the poo-poo sandwich where it's some good fluffy crap with some reality on top of some more fluffy crap. It's the facts of what happened. And so think about um, the workspace. You talked about it, right? Like the the observer, the people watching from the cheap seats are going to be saying, oh, you did it wrong. So again, supervisor. If you have a punitive response to bad news or a less than optimal performance, you are killing vulnerability. If you can receive problems as an indication of your of you leveraging your experience, your influence, your relationships, and your authority to make things better, you're going to cultivate vulnerability. And so what does that look like for real, for real? Jeff, tell me if you've ever seen this. There's a monthly uh, financial review on a project or quarterly financial review on a project, which should be a simple print. (laughs) Let's have a meeting. Let me highlight the problems because I'm taking this up to people that have some stroke so that they can help me solve my problems and close the gap on what we're looking for. I've never seen that. What do I see? I've seen many, many times where the person that is going to this quarterly or monthly review spend hours upon hours upon hours moving money around, budgeting, changing margin, hiding money, just in case, like they spend all this time polishing the hell out of this stinky, funky turd so that they don't get yelled at. Where's the business value in that? And so the problem persists until they run out of schedule and run out of budget And now it's too late to do anything about it because we weren't surfacing problems. We weren't listening, providing direct feedback. We were afraid of being vulnerable. What do you think? Is that like a totally made up story? Am I like in Disneyland? No, you're completely right. (laughs) Nope. I've uh, I've been asked on the data side to uh, polish a few of those turds (laughs) over over time and, and, and went, well, yeah, I can make data say anything I want to make it say, but uh, don't we want to know the truth, the reality? Yes. You know, and and honestly, don't we want to know it as soon as we can? Because yeah. then we've got so much time to make up. Mm-hmm. But and this is why we say it. We go to every meeting in this industry. And I, I heard this from an estimator at one point in my early time at join. We go into every meeting ready to fight our way out. Oh yes. Right. Armed. We got, yeah. we got swords. We're just, we're just waiting for when do I draw it and who do I draw it on when they've made themselves vulnerable enough for me to slice them. Yep. Instead of, you know, really fostering an environment in which we can be vulnerable, create trust. There's no better foundation and there is no trust without vulnerability. I'm a huge Brene Brown fan and she drove that through my head. And, and ever since I've just realized that that's what we need. And this is why I don't care what your contract structure is. I don't care how it's built. Show me how your team acts and I will tell you, predict how the project will go. Truth. Right. If you, if you come into the room and you're vulnerable and you've got trust as a team and you can work on problems, you can surface problems, you can connect with one another, you're going to blow that job out of the water. Yes. If you can't, you got no hope. You know, and, and, it's and suck <laughs> bad. <laughs> and as a data guy, I can tell you, look at the statistics at the number of jobs that come in over budget 
over schedule and uh it, it's astronomical the bigger the project the bigger the chance this mm -hmm. is going to happen which is really funny to me because the bigger the project the bigger the opportunity for everybody to do well the yeah. higher the stakes but the higher the stakes the more we fall back to these other methods and I want to connect this back, Jesse, to the trade partner and the field and and all of those men and women that are putting in work. In the end, our inability to get out of our own way and our just reliance on this, in the end, shit rolls downhill and that's where it's landing and that's why we have the level of problem that we have. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just think hands down, it's things like this that we need to focus on and apply ourselves to as an industry. And it's why I wanted you two both to come on here and talk about it because you're agents of change in a way that, I mean, I don't even know that you guys know that one, bun, you know, couple days at So Built together and one time out in front on the Jen and Jess no BS where I said I was there and a few lurker times because I have I'm not lurking because I, I want to lurk but I have little ones and it's 7 a.m. here and they're right. usually sleeping uh, so have had that kind of impact on the way I look at a conversation the way I talk to people and show up you change the way I show up every day and inspired me to help others show up that way. So that's why I wanted to have you two on today and just um, highlight what you're doing. So you've got, you've got the book. So um, Jesse, let people know where they can get the book, where they can connect with you. Yeah. Yeah. Book is on Amazon, lean in love, five uh, S love letters. Uh, we have, you can go to the YouTube um, learnings and missteps, five S love letters and see the live streams. Cause they're still out there for the world to watch. And the best way to get a hold of me is on LinkedIn. Type in Jesse Depth Builder, and you'll find me kind of the way you introduced me, Jesus, Jesse, da 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 da. Um, and I'm pretty hyperactive on LinkedIn. And aside from that, I, I have to keep my address uh, a secret, just, you know, crowd control and that sort of thing. It's it's a it's a pretty good idea, but you got to connect with them on, <laughs> on LinkedIn. It's really fun to watch. Jen, let everybody know where they can get involved and, you know, learn more about you and maybe get involved with the Jen and Jess. No BS with Jen and Jess. So for me, again, LinkedIn is the best way to connect with me. I, I check it all the time. So that's the uh, the best way to do that. And then if you want to follow Jesse and I or see all the stuff that we're doing on our platform, if you just push no space BS. It's usually the very top thing that pulls up. And so it's called no BS with Jen and Jess. And that is our platform. And that's kind of, and not only is it a platform, but over two years, we have a no BS tribe that is like no other. Like it is a group of people and it continues to grow. And their sole purpose is to elevate and highlight and connect and build people up like it, it it is crazy every time something gets shared by one we have people jumping in it's just how they this one needs a job this one's got a you know has a, a somebody in this area that it's just it's just the way that they have fostered just community has been amazing well i i have to say there's no better way to end this episode than that way and to thank you two for taking the time to sit down with me to talk through this to really share your insights share your knowledge but um just inspiring people to be human to be vulnerable to create trust and change this wonderful industry we didn't even we didn't even really dig in but you two are both just zealots around the built world and and what we are doing so if that didn't come across in, in this conversation, then I don't know that you guys were listening. So <laughs> thanks to you both for, for sitting down with me today and, and donating your time to the show. Thank you, Jeff, for having thank us. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in today to geek out for our interview with Jesus, Jesse Hernandez, and Jen Lacey. To read all our news stories, learn more about our guests, and to listen to the show, visit thecontactcrew.com. 
This is the Contact Crew signing out. Until next time, enjoy the ride and geek out.